Charlene. Charlene was very helpful in, in the uh, logistics of setting this webcast up. And I really want to thank you for allowing us to use your facility to do the broadcast from today because we have Love Inc., uh, you folks, and then members of the Ontario Chamber of Commerce that will be talking in the last half hour of the show. Well, I'll tell you, this is tremendous to be a, a part of this. Well, thank you. Ron Verini. Uh, we are here at Veterans Advocates, Veteran Advocates of Orida. What is this organization all about? Veteran Advocates of Orida is an organization that uh, basically is a uh, organization that helps not only veterans but family members, uh, communicates to the community, uh, educates, uh, goes into schools. Uh, we have programs, believe it or not, that uh, basically all of them have been born out of tragedy. Uh, whether we're talking uh, our Pencils for Peace program, which is a humana humanitarian effort uh, that was actually developed by uh, a young lady in town by the name of uh, Gaylene Dewey. Uh, she had a son in the service and he worked with Major Dickerson in Afghanistan and uh, uh, Major Dickerson uh, happened to meet a little a girl in the street uh, by the name of Ja L, and uh, she in Iraq or Afghanistan. He met in Afghanistan. Okay. okay. And uh, when she met, uh, when he met this little girl, uh, uh, she had a uh, ten-inch gash on her stomach, and and she was getting repaired by the mm -hmm. army, and she was out there begging. Uh, not for money, not for food, but for a pencil. And the pencil, uh, come to find out uh, through a translator, uh, she wanted to write a letter uh, to the doctors, the American doctors that saved her life. Uh, she was hit by an IED. And uh, he decided that, uh, you know, there's a need. Mm -hmm. There's a need in that country uh, to not only help the children of uh, Afghanistan, uh, but in turn help our uh, our people over there helping them. Uh, so, in, so make a long story short, mm -hmm. we started collecting pencils yeah. and construction paper, uh, crayons, notebooks, right. that sort of thing. We sent them uh, to Major Dickerson. Mm -hmm. He distributed them uh, to the uh, schools and orphanages mm -hmm. in Afghanistan and uh, woe and behold, not only did we start educating the children over there, helping educate the children, but little by little we started to get information back as far as where the IEDs were, where the bad guys were, mm -hmm. where the uh, caches of weapons were. Mm -hmm. So not only did we educate or help educate the children, we helped our forces over there uh, uh, bring a humanitarian effort to the community and get information to ac actually help ourselves. One of the things we hear from veterans that are serving in Iraq and Afghanistan is they say, Dave, we'd really like more publicity about the humanitarian, the good things we're doing over there. So much in the media today, we want to concentrate on battle statistics, the combat, and, yeah. and things that we blow up and take down, and so on and so forth. But I talked to one veteran and he said, you know, we're working, a lot of times we're working on the water system, bringing them good water to drink, pencils for peace. And we hardly ever hear about what good we're doing over there, helping out the children of the country. Well, what are the groups? Oh, go ahead. I was just going to mention that uh, one of the things that came about shortly after this episode with the Pencils for Peace mm -hmm. and in line with the humanitarian efforts was uh, we had a son of one of our local moms that requested fabric because they were trying to teach the Iraqi women how to sew and okay. they don't have fabric readily available. So we put a play out to the community and we're inundated with all kinds of fabric which we sent boxes and boxes to them over there they thought they had received a million bucks to get this fabric and most of this was fabric that sewers had left over in their closets and so forth mm -hmm. their stash yeah. and these people thought this was wonderful and they were able to teach these women to sew in order to go out and make a livelihood while their uh, spouses were fighting the war. 
I was talking to a missionary serving overseas, and he said, you know what? He said, some people would kill or would die for the things that we throw away in America. Absolutely. Pencils. You know, sometimes our pencil gets this short, and we think, oh, I'll just go buy another one and throw it away. But uh, to a little girl in Iraq or Afghanistan, she would, would oh, she would do almost anything to get that oh, yeah. pencil. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. And, you know, just a pencil. Uh, one of the things that we're also seeing is, is kind of the changing face of our society. We talked about the changing face of homelessness just a moment ago. One of the things that, that we're concerned about is we continue to work with veterans organizations in Operation Eagle's Wings, honoring all who serve and leaving no one behind, is that the issue of PTSD and suicide is a big issue right now. And, and people on the street have asked me, Dave, why is that? Why is that so much more in this campaign than others? And one of the, one of the reasons that I'm told is because of the multiple deployments. In World War II in Vietnam, when a, when a soldier served his tour of duty, he was able to come home. But now, because of the limited amount of, of sources there are, resources there are men and women in the military, they may often go back, and there are people that are serving five, six tours of duty. Well, if you think about it, even our, our local National Guard just came back from, in some cases, third and fourth deployment. Right. And if, uh, you know, you've got a family unit, mm -hmm. and uh, whatever spouse goes over there and serves in a combat zone, uh, he becomes accustomed to a combat environment and then he comes back mm -hmm. and his wife or uh, other case significant, significant other, other uh, uh, you know has been actually running the family right all this time and they expect uh, especially the National Guard uh, to come back into the community and assimilate back into society as if nothing has happened. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult. Uh, it, the the uh, heartache and the, uh, and the pain uh, that is in the soldier's mind mm -hmm. when he comes back doesn't leave right away. Mm -hmm. And they do need help. And it's one of the reasons why Veteran Advocates of Verida is working so closely with the VA. Mm -hmm. uh, we have uh, the Vet Center van come over here to Ontario, and it's also going to Nyssa now. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it's a 38-foot van that is set up especially for combat veterans. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't make any difference what war or what right. conflict. Uh -huh. And they come back. And they usually have a counselor aboard uh, from the Vietnam era, and we also have uh, a counselor aboard from the Iraq-Afghanistan era. Mm -hmm. And they have an opportunity to actually talk with the veterans in the community, uh, make appointments, uh, sign up for the VA, mm -hmm. and get the benefits that they absolutely deserve and need. And I, I think, Dave, that you made the comment about um, we're hearing a lot of about PTSD in, yeah. in, in currently, and and actually, if you even go back to World War II, mm -hmm. um, it existed. They called it shell shock back right. then. It had a different name. That's right, but it still existed. Any any soldier that has served in a war zone experiences some type of that, based on exactly what Ron is saying, mm -hmm. and that's one of our main. Um, part of our mission in this office here is to provide a safe environment that these veterans and their families come, can come in and feel safe, sit down and have a cup of coffee, talk with other soldiers that have been through what they've been through. That alone is extremely healing. So part of it is we may be just more aware of the issue. I've talked to veterans <laughs> advocates who say, Dave, some Vietnam veterans are still experiencing PTSD. Absolutely. You're just not aware of it because it's not as forefront in the media as all of the uh, men and women coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan. We had make a front page news. We had a World War II veteran come in the other day uh, uh, with his daughter uh, that just now is starting to experience problems from World War II. Really? So, I mean, y you know, it, it's not a, uh, a tomorrow problem, it's not a uh, next year problem, 
Uh, this is a problem that, that sneaks up on you 30, 40, 50 years from combat. And it's one of the reasons why, uh, actually another reason why we have Veteran Advocates of Verida. Veteran Advocates of Verida is an organization that is made up of all volunteers. Mm -hmm. We have no paid employees whatsoever here. So it's a grassroots organization. Uh, uh, our board of directors uh, encompasses the whole community, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, we have everybody from the uh, executive director of the Chamber of Commerce to uh, war veterans to uh, community uh, members. Uh, senior citizens. Senior citizens, yeah. Uh, and uh, this young lady over here, mm -hmm. uh, she has uh, six brothers uh, that were in the Air Force, uh, which is really exciting. So it's not only veterans that are a member of this organization, mm -hmm. it's their family members, it's community members that are interested in, in uh, veteran affairs. Uh, uh, they can come in since there is absolutely no dues, right. no financial obligation of anybody walking through the door, they can come in, sit down, have a cup of coffee, uh, learn from each other. Uh, we have a rack of information that uh, we have put together because one of the biggest problems for a soldier coming back and their family mm -hmm. is finding information to get their benefits. Mm -hmm. uh, some of it is local, some of it is uh, state, uh, some of it is federal and you try to put all these pieces together and usually there is no one location that you can go to gather all this information up. So what we have attempted to do is gather all of that information in one place. I mean we're not going to have all the answers that's for sure. But, but in helping. one place where they can come in and find out well can I get help locally. Yeah. And it's also one of the reasons why we work with organizations like the VFW, the American Legion, the DAV, Paralyzed Vets of America. All of these organizations are important to our veterans. Mm -hmm. And they're important because each one of these organizations have projects, programs that can help our veterans and help them assimilate not not only back into the community, mm -hmm. uh, but for their, uh, their mental problems, if they yeah. have that, etc. One of the things that we've noticed and that we've heard from veterans, uh, in this case, I'll be using an example of a female veteran, is she really, she came, I'm not going to mention a name, but she came from a dysfunctional family and really liked the structure of the military really like the family environment, the family atmosphere. You get up in the morning, you know exactly what you've got to do. Somebody might be barking orders at you, but there's, there's a I've got your back attitude. Right. When you go into combat, you're constantly trained that you watch out for the other guy. Uh, you leave no one behind in the field of battle. There's this camaraderie, this family, uh, where I watch your back, you watch mine, and we'll, get, we'll make it to the end of the day. So this, they, they get into this family environment and then they're released from service. They they go home, and the culture shock because out there you're kind of on your own, right? And they don't. All of a sudden, this this close, cohesive, I've got your back attitude. They're on their own, and, and that's been a real problem. And Dave, that's an an increased problem with our Army National Guard that mm -hmm. there is a. Uh, many in the Oregon area mm -hmm. because uh, as in my brother's case when they came back from overseas they went to a, a base right. and they still have that family atmosphere and that camaraderie but the Army National Guard when they come back from their deployments they go back to their families and they don't have that base to return to so that's an almost an increase of them feeling lost and not knowing where to turn. And that's the reason why we're here. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're here six days a week. We're open six days a week mm -hmm. for people to walk through that door. Uh, and when they walk through that door, they start understanding mm -hmm. that they have the community behind them. Right. That's a very important and point. And we've had members of the community say, Dave, I really want to help. But they're sensitive because they know that there's some experiences that the soldier has been in that um, they don't want to talk about. But they want to help, 
but they quite they don't know what to say they don't know how to approach the soldier uh, what would be your advice in that area be themselves just but accept show that they them care. as they are thank them for their service right. and just treat them as if they would treat anybody else mm -hmm. you know they don't need to be talking about their war days especially the the current vets returning they're not ready right. to talk about this my father was in World War II mm -hmm. and uh, up until he died, we know very little about his wartime. He wasn't ready to talk to us about it. Mm -hmm. But it, that's not what we're here for, to get them to talk about it. What we're here for is is to, to provide that safe environment, mm -hmm. to provide community outreach for them, and to educate them and their families of that we're here for them and we will do what their needs are and yeah, what you don't want to do is walk on eggshells no you okay. just don't want to do it that you know uh, these are men and women uh, that are just like you and I mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. everyday people uh, they're attorneys they're uh, physicians uh, physicians in the community uh, they're homeless people mm -hmm. uh, they're the people that have needs in some cases and other cases they uh, they are the people that are helping the ones in need mm -hmm. uh, and uh, one of the things that we found uh, especially in, in veteran advocates of Verida is we have a tremendous amount of support from our veterans mm -hmm. and it's veterans helping veterans veterans going out into the community educating our children mm -hmm. about what a veteran is right uh, what a combat zone is yes uh, we have a project that is going on uh, right now with the middle school right here in Ontario Oregon. in Ontario okay and it is absolutely fantastic the first time that we did it was last year well tell us about the program and how does it work what it is is uh, we purchased a 8 by 16 foot mobile room and one of those it was portable classrooms one of these uh, portable right okay yes. and uh, we really you know we were thinking about just putting a museum in there and walking uh, right. going around to the different uh, communities or whatever well an art uh, teacher came up to us his name is uh, Brian Hobbs mm -hmm. and he says you know our art class wants to do something mm -hmm. for the veterans and yeah. uh, what they did is they actually painted this 8 by 16 foot mobile museum now mm -hmm. and how the teacher got all the students involved is he, every student had a one by one foot mm -hmm. place to paint a, uh, a mural mm -hmm. on this big building on the outside on the, the outside okay. of the building and by gosh, I mean, there was an it's eagle. It, it is magnificent. The they, twin towers were the there. The twin towers were there. And they really showed passion. And along with this, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Glenn Crosby got a group of people together, mm -hmm. veterans, right. World War II, Vietnam vets, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Iraq, mm -hmm. Afghanistan vets, mm -hmm. and went into the classrooms. and basically had a question and answer session about what was their involvement in the military mm -hmm. now this year they're not only expanding it they're repainting over what they've done last year for the new students and they're going to get the uh, English class involved in writing letters to our wounded warriors as well as uh, to our troops overseas uh, that are serving but and they left one pan one side uh, still painted mm -hmm. as a From memorial to the people last year that worked so diligently um, they didn't want to paint everything mm -hmm. that they right. did and that will be left and this year's group will paint new a new mm -hmm. mural on there and then next year we'll do the same thing with them leave a, a part of their year now, as far as veteran services are concerned with the government, uh, is there any way that, you know, and we don't want to get political here, but um, <laughs> are we doing a good enough job as far as veteran services? Do we need to do more? And specifically, what areas? Sometimes it's a situation of not just maybe we don't have to spend more money, which we probably do, 
but is there some areas that maybe we can improve our services? What's your take? Well, I think, you know, if you talk about veteran services, 99% of veterans uh, get their benefits without any problems. Okay. It's the 1% or 2% or maybe 3% uh, that fall through the cracks. Uh, these are the guys and women, in, in the case of Vietnam, they've come back from war, uh, they've gotten off the plane, uh, they've been mistreated by the uh, people as soon as they get off the plane. They yeah. go into a VA facility and uh, maybe there's a lot of tension going on at that particular point in time. Right. So they feel sort of pushed to the side when they came back from war. And when that happened, they just chopped the system totally off and went off on their own to try to accomplish what they needed to accomplish by themselves. Well, it wasn't that easy. And over the years, I think our government has realized that you know, we need to bring these people on board. Mm -hmm. They do have problems. They do right. have situations that uh, reflect back on maybe uh, somebody saying something just a little off color that just sent them off. Mm -hmm. uh, the same thing uh, today. Uh, we learn from our different conflicts. We learn from our different war situations. When we first brought back the uh, the National Guard on their mm -hmm. first deployment, yeah. uh, they got off the planes and with a, in a couple days they were with their families. Right. Well, we learned that you know that's really not a good thing to do uh, because you know once they come out of a war zone and they go immediately to their family. Where's the information to get to them, how to get help, if they do have a problem? Mm -hmm. So now there's a little cooling off period. Mm -hmm. There's sometimes eight days, two weeks, and then they go back uh, 30 days later or, or three months later, and, and they're reevaluated to see if there is a problem coming about. But with all this said, mm -hmm. and with all this money that the government is actually sure. putting into the system, there is always going to be a slippage. Somebody's going to fall you know, through the cracks. That, uh, somebody's going to fall through the cracks or somebody's going to say something that, you know, just ticks somebody off mm -hmm. and they're not going to go into the system and get help. Uh, so, I mean, but I also think that I go back to the safe environment, which I feel is very, very, a very important aspect of our organization in that we have had some of these veterans walk in this door. Mm -hmm. And as soon as they stop at that desk, the first thing they want to talk about is the injustices that they received through the VA and they didn't get what they should and right. it's all a bunch of nonsense and all of this. And when we can say to them, come on and sit down and have a cup of coffee, and they see the the positive energy that is directed in this office mm -hmm. to just accept them and thank them for their service. It is amazing the turnaround and and sometimes we can get these veterans to regroup and go back and say okay I will try the system again. One of the things that we're noticing about when you have organizations like Veteran Advocates of Orida in Central Oregon in the Bend area we have a Central Oregon Veterans Outreach and a uh, real interesting organization we're involved with is Band of Brothers in Central Oregon. And mm -hmm. veterans, uh, especially when they're coming back from deployment, they really like to visit, be around other veterans because they've shared experiences. Exactly. They know what it's like to be in war mm -hmm. in a combat zone and, and they just like getting back. Like Band of Brothers in Central Oregon has meets every uh, Monday morning at 11 at Jake's in a restaurant uh, in Bend, Oregon. And one of the things that initially was happening as the first deployments were coming back is the Iraq-Afghanistan veterans are a different age group than the World War II Vietnam veterans. And they were having a little bit of a difficulty plugging in because they had different, you know, like, like different music. They were just a different genre. They were a different culture. But we're seeing more and more of those Iraq, Afghanistan veterans getting involved in the VFW and the vet and uh, those organizations, and Band of Brothers. Band of Brothers right now is 
uh, being challenged with having a meeting space big enough to hold their hundred and so people that show up every Monday. Refreshing, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> and I bet that many of them, when they first started meeting, it wasn't to talk about the war days. It was no. just to be together, to, to, to joke, to laugh, to have a good time. And that's where it begins, the healing begins. Mm -hmm. And then they're willing to go and get the counseling they need or talk to other people about what what their needs might be. Mm -hmm. And and those those type of programs are just extremely valuable. So two things we want to leave people with right now. Number one, for the general public that might be watching, how can we help the returning servicemen and women? Welcome them home. Thank them for their service. That's it. And should we ask them? Can I help you in any way? Is there anything you need? I think, you know, I think now you're getting into a, a very touchy subject because, uh, you know, can I help? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Okay. But to go any further than that and, and start dwelling into uh, what they've experienced, I don't think would be a good thing. I think, you know, treating them just like they were your neighbors, mm -hmm. uh, treating them as a brother or sister, I think is more important uh, help uh, than going out there and trying to force something on something that uh, somebody that they don't really want it. Okay. I think an example that I think is a perfect example to, to leave with is we had a National Guard commanding officer that mm -hmm. just returned from his fourth deployment. Fourth deployment. Fourth deployment. Okay. Um, he came into our office two or three days after he returned. What he came in <coughs> for and was looking for was a hug from us to thank him mm -hmm. for coming back safely. That's mm -hmm. all he wanted. He didn't want to talk about the war. No. And that's what we gave him. Okay. We had an experience similar to that. It was a, war, it was a Vietnam era veteran. Mm -hmm. And this was a homeless veteran, and he was in uh, uh, Covo, Central Oregon Veterans Outreach, where they do a tremendous outreach for the homeless veterans in Central Oregon. And uh, this person uh, was not having a good day, and we went up to him and said, you know, I, I shook his hand, I just talked to him, made eye contact, I just want to thank you for your service. This was a Vietnam era vet, homeless, and he started to cry. And the reason he did was he said, you know, it has been a long time since somebody told me that. Absolutely. They came back, they were spit on, they had rocks thrown at them. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what they want, a handshake, a thank you for their service. And, and the anger that is with many of them just dissolves. Yeah, that's a big deal. Mm -hmm. If people want to get involved with Veteran Advocates of Orida here in Ontario, Oregon, again, it's... Uh, Southeast Oregon, right in the border between Idaho and Oregon is where we are today. How do they do that? Oh, quite simply, they can go to our website, which is www.veteransingularadvocatesplural.org. So that's www.veteranadvocates.org. Or give us a call, 541-88... Uh, Nine, 1978. <laughs> All right, what do you got? I like your number, 1978. It's an easy one to remember. Yes. Ron, thank you for letting thank us you use your facility much, today. Thank and you for your service. One of the things we didn't talk about was behind us there's these quilts. Let's talk about that real quickly. Uh, are these quilts given to soldiers? The quilt program is a, is a very interesting program. Uh, it actually developed uh, on 9-12, the day after 9-11. Really? And same year. Uh, pardon me? The same year that 9-11 occurred. The exactly. next day, day they after. The next day exactly. they started making quilts. And it happened in uh, Merrill, uh, Oregon. Oregon. And uh, it's a uh, organization that is loosely knit mm -hmm. together. No pun and, intended. Uh, exactly. Yeah. And what they do is uh, they produce quilts. Uh, and when I say they, it's the community that produces the quilts. Uh, the churches in our area here, uh, they are all made to government specifications. Uh, uh, Judy Crothers is the lady that brought it to our attention. Mm -hmm. And uh, we jumped on the bandwagon and uh, the first project that we had was producing 300 quilts, uh, uh, 150 for Foxtrot Company and 150 for Charlie Company of the okay. 116th. 
and uh, everybody in the community is involved, whether they be veterans, uh, whether you can sew or can't sew, uh, and each quilt is given to a veteran that we know about, mm -hmm. uh, either sent to them over to Iraq or Afghanistan, or given to them before they leave. And what's a touching thing, especially about giving it to them before they leave, mm -hmm. is a lot of the veteran or the uh, members that receive these, instead of taking them with them and using them on the ground, they wrap their children in them, and they keep it with the child and so the child remembers the spouse or the uh, father or mother uh, every time they wrap themselves in the quilt uh, while they're home. So I mean, it's a, uh, it's, it's a project that I think is quite exciting. Well over 6,000 quilts have been produced since the beginning of this. Okay. And Ron we've and had them made all the way from Silverton, Oregon. Okay. <laughs> Charlene, thank you, Ron. Thank you for helping. Oh, Dave. Thank you for helping thank us to coordinate much. the program and use you're your facility welcome. today. And what we'd like to do is we'd like to come back. There's other things that you're doing, Adopt a Soldier, Pencils for Peace, and there's other I've looked through your, your facility here and there's lots of different programs. I'd like to talk a little bit more, but we're out of time today. That'd be but great. we'd okay. like to come back. Good. We okay. welcome you Thanks, all. Thanks, Dave. Okay, thank you very thank much. Thank you.